One of the jacks is not keeping pace with the others. This malfunction could cause the span to topple into the water below, taking everything and everyone with it. Mechanic Hector Macias thinks he's found a solution. By accelerating the jack motor on the northeast corner, he's confident he can match the rate of descent of the other three motors and even out the alignment. It looks like that east northeast motor consistently has been about an inch, maybe a half inch a stroke short. So we brought the RPMs up, see if we can pick them up. Southside side hold. Hector, let me know when your lower forks are in. Scott orders a leveling stroke on the northeast corner. It works. All's well again, but not for long. Scott, you got a copy? Over, Scott. The team hits a new snag. You got a tangled vest over here on one side. The cables twist on their way to the jacks, bunching up into a tangled mess. Trying to feed them through the jacks gets harder and harder, like trying to run a brush through knotted hair. The jam could bring the whole operation to another standstill. We've been having problems because we're pushing everything to the limit. The iron workers wrestle to keep the cables straight near the jack head. But the tangle worsens with each jack stroke. Copy that, hold. Hector, hold that 16, but uh, grab Lupe. It looks like Matt's gonna need some help getting the cable. You're pretty tight there in the couple of The tangled cables slow the entire operation to a crawl. There's no time for a problem like this. Cargo ships expect the strait to reopen on time. Commerce depends on it. But the hanging span presents an impassable object. is totally stuck. One of the cables received a permanent kink, and it couldn't go through the jack smoothly. There's only one solution, and it's a last resort. Project manager David Piermarini decides to cut any problem cables. Each weight-bearing cable cut reduces the margin for error. Now, the remaining cables must pick up the span's entire weight. The crew works into the night and then tries again. Some twisted cables remain, so each stroke of the lowering jacks continues to be a chore. They fight more and more tangled cables every bit of the way. They cut a second cable. Scott finally calls the day after 16 hours of non-stop work. Everyone will be back at 6 a.m. After just a few hours of sleep, how are you doing this morning? Good, how are you? The tired crew returns to finish the job. The 635-ton span dangles 15 meters above the strait. On Scott Soldis's command, they fire up the jacks and try again. I'm back in business. At last, the span moves smoothly, and the section drops another 40 centimeters. The second cable cut last night made the difference. The team rediscovers its groove.
By midday, the span hangs just above the barges. The way things are going, we should make contact within 45 minutes after the barge is in place and ready for us to come down. The first major handoff of the operation is within reach. Jeff Holfelder prepares to take over. Oh, we still have a good 10 feet to go. Jeff's daunting mission? Catch the 635-ton bridge span from below. We pulled straws and I, I got the wrong straw. <laughs> The bridge gets to within three meters of the water, and Jeff starts directing. I'll uh, let Scott know the minute uh, we're getting close. Just a heads up, but uh, just keep on coming. Side down, 16. Yeah, I copy. Go ahead and come down, Chuck, all the way. Send her back up. It's definitely more wind than they were predicting. A little hectic with the tide and the wind. Everything's floating around right now, and we're trying to, uh, we've got good alignment on the bridge and the barge, and I want to come down just on this end until it comes within our guides here. The barges have special frames to catch the span and hold it in place. But the span won't fit until the crew cuts away some smaller pieces. Now, the span can connect with the barge. Okay, Scott, you have a copy? We're lined up on both barges. Let's come down at least one stroke, if not two. Okay, everybody down. The bridge releases the weight of the span onto the barges and relaxes for the first time in 80 years. As the, the bridge touches down on the barges, the cables are in a stretched and tight condition and the cables will essentially shorten as they, as they relax and as the load comes out of them. And then, in fact, the bridge itself recoils and will, will tend to relax or, or bounce up more than a negligible amount, um, and we need to account for that. Jay for Scott. No one knows for sure how it will go. Chuck, are you hearing me? Everyone is nervous. Jay, you're trying to reach Chuck or me? There's too many people talking on this frequency. Okay, Hector, you ready to come down? I'm ready to come down. Okay, both sides come down 16. We have to hit the target. We have about a six inch tolerance. It's gotta be right on the money. Finally, the last stroke of the jacks lands the span squarely on the barge. It needs to be secured immediately. No one wants 635 tons of steel moving with the waves. At that time, everything gets real busy. Scott, you have a copy? A copy. They connect the bridge to the barges with a specially built harness system. But even locked down, the span remains in a dangerous position, still tethered to the bridge above and at the mercy of the swift currents below. All the cables must be cut and fast before the waves can make the cables pull on the bridge and cause it to collapse. At last, they free the span from above. But there's no time for celebration. They still have to float the span four miles into the bay through a channel barely wider than the span itself.
Yeah, Dan, this is Jeff, California Insurance. We're, we're uh, getting ready to get you up here. We're just about to... The giant span from the Carquinas Bridge, secured to the two barges, makes it a vessel over 120 meters wide, twice as wide as an aircraft carrier. And every ship needs a captain. Yeah, finally. Captain Dan DeForge is a veteran Bay Area tug pilot. My job is 99% sheer boredom, but it's 1% sheer terror, as we say. With a vessel this big, it'll be a tight squeeze from San Francisco's Carquina Strait, six and a half kilometers up the channel to Mare Island. In places, Dan will have just six meters on each side to squeeze through. A shift in wind, current, or tide, and he could easily run aground. Spent many hours just getting acquainted with exactly what the currents are doing by the minute. Two tugs will push the colossal structure, but Dan won't be aboard either. This extraordinary challenge calls for extraordinary measures. You have to be in a position where you can see what's going on. And the, and the higher you are, the better off you are. The captain's chair sits 10 stories up on top of the span. Everyone waits while Dan climbs to his perch. He sits right on top of the middle of the span, and he's able to see the structure, coordinate with both of the operators of the tugboats that are pushing the structure. He knows these waters and these currents as well as anyone. One of my pet peeves is I want to know when the baton is passed to me. And when the baton is passed to me, I want the radio silence strictly with us. Dan's first challenge, getting the detached span out and away from the two neighboring bridges. They cast off from their anchorage, and Dan gives the order. And I'm looking at everything to see which direction the wind's going to push us, which direction the current's going to push us. And, and then eventually, one of the tugboats, I tell him, half ahead. The widest vessel in the world slowly pushes off. And slowly but surely, this whole structure started to move. And uh, I think most people were, just, uh, that sense chills up our spines, you know, because it's actually happening. The good ship Carquinas sets sail on her first voyage in 80 years. And her last. Now, Dan and his team must steer the new ship through the narrow channel. From the surface, there looks to be ample room to cruise through. But beneath the water, the channel narrows to less than six meters on either side. Dan doesn't want to rush, but he must also get through before the change in tide makes the channel even more shallow. It takes nearly two hours. But they squeeze through. Only one final challenge to go, docking the ship. This is parallel parking on a giant scale. And Dan has not one, but two tugs to maneuver. This was, I think, probably uh, the most difficult part of the job, actually, was getting the barges secured. There was a barge that was tied up alongside the dock, and we then had to straddle that barge, and we only had about 20 feet on either side. Slow and steady, the span slides perfectly into place. They've done it. They've cut down a fragile 635-ton piece of bridge